fairies, sometimes spelled fairies if you're into that, are part of a long tradition in mythology from cultures all over the world. They often represent an intermediary race, mystical creatures living in a supernatural existence, but parallel to us in many ways, somewhere between the realms of human and angels. Early incarnations were sometimes evil. The Egyptians thought of them as demons, while in ancient Greece and Rome, Genie were spirits who brought ill omens when they revealed themselves to humans. But today we are going to focus mainly on the prolific and havoc-raising fairies throughout Ireland and the United Kingdom. In J.S. Forsyth's seminal 1827 text, Demonologia, or Natural Knowledge Revealed, being an expose of ancient and modern superstitions, he claims that there is a long lineage throughout all of Europe that contributed in some way to the concept of fairies. But the most direct origin might date back to mythology of the Old Norse gods, in which little beings, with the most delicate figures, lived in underground caves or in the crags of rocks, and were known for their wealth, which they were very good at accumulating because they did whatever it took to get what they wanted, even if it was evil. Fairy lore became so common, Forsyth describes, in most northern countries of Europe, there were few families that were without a shrewd or knavish sprite. Depending on how a family treated the fae in their life, lives could be made easier or much, much harder. For centuries, there's been a duality to fairies. They were evil when it suited human needs to explain bad luck, but if outcomes were favorable, the creatures were precious protectors. One proverbial blessing in England even said, grant that the sweet fairies may nightly put money in your shoes and sweep your house clean. Their lore was frequently manipulated to serve human intention. For example, in the case of witchcraft, communing with fairies was the same as communing with demons, a crime that could cause a witch to be burned at the stake. In other cases, if a woman reported seeing fairies, she might be diagnosed with hysteria, causing ecstatic illusions. The Irish Celtic Gaelic traditions of the little people continued to be one of the most pervasive, celebrated, and long-lasting histories in fairy lore. Irish fairies were commonly called she. They were also sometimes referred to as fa-ri, which was thought to be derived from the Persian word puri, one of the earliest known examples of fairies. The Puri's influence on European folklore traces back to the Crusades of the 11th century, Christian holy wars fought in Palestine and the Middle East to usurp Islamic rule in the region. An intelligent, incredibly beautiful, and largely female mythical race, the Puri's actions were usually benevolent, but according to legend, the Puri's were trapped in their fairy form because of a sin they had committed. The price of their atonement was to have neither a mortal soul nor immortal power. Similarly, by one theory, the Irish she were fallen angels. Like Lucifer, they had been cast from heaven due to their pride. This may also speak to the Christianization of pagan mythology, an evolutionary synthesis of the belief systems. Others believed that fairies were the spirits of the Tua de Danann, a mysterious early Irish race that was partially divine. The she lived in Tir na Og, a place where there was no disease, where everyone was perpetually young, and everything around them was created for joy and beauty. Death can only come to the she on Judgment Day. In their natural state, the she were similar to humans, but known for their preternatural beauty, with delicate, lithe bodies and corn-colored blonde hair that was so long it could touch the ground. They sometimes wore diaphanous robes of silver fabric, However, with their magic, the she had the power to take any form, conceal themselves completely, and could even make their own horses using scraps of straw. Their diet included milk and honey served in gold vessels, as well as the nectar of flowers they could drink directly from, like cups. There were said to be even more fairies than humans on Earth, and they were ruled by numerous chiefs who distinguished themselves by wearing a ring of gold called a circlet around their head. Their homes were built underground, often beneath lakes, Norman ruins, or in the core of a hill. But inside, they were deceptively luxurious palaces made out of diamonds, pearls, silver, and gold. The she hoarded their many treasures in their homes, some of which they took from shipwrecks or from thieves who had to bury their loot. 
They didn't really need to steal wealth from humans, though. The gold and jewels that lived in the rocks all belonged to the fairies anyway. There was nearly always music and dancing in their palace halls, and under special circumstances, a human might be blessed with the opportunity to see them dancing on the hillsides. There were several ways a human might see the she, one of which was to walk nine times around a fairy ring, which scholars believe are actually the ancient remains of circularly shaped settlements called Ra. After nine times around the fairy ring, the human interloper may see the entrance and possibly even enter. But if they did, they might be trapped forever, either by eating the fairy food and wine or by becoming so enamored by their beauty while watching them dance and sing, they go mad for a fairy kiss and can never leave. While some might be adventurous enough to go looking for them, on the whole, the Irish dreaded the fairies' wrath so much, they would not build on their land nor say fairies out loud for fear of angering them, instead referring to them as the good people or the little people. While the she had no religion, they did seem to fear some aspects of Catholicism. According to legend, when they fell from heaven, some were taken to hell by demons, where they gained the power to set evil spirits on humans. To this effect, they had powers over unbaptized children and could make them grow up to be evil or harbingers of bad luck. The fairies could send evil spirits in the form of beautiful women, charming men with their song and dance to the point that they would commit heinous crimes for them. When their souls were black with the sins they had committed for the evil spirit, they would be taken to hell to serve and be tortured by the demons who lived there for eternity. Despite the beauty, youth, and luxurious leisure of their existence, the she were said to be inherently sad as well. They remembered that they had been cast from heaven and could never return. In this, humans had an advantage. Upon their death, they could go to heaven and live there for the rest of eternity. Belief in the she is so deeply ingrained and pervasive in Irish culture, it has been called a national and ethnic inheritance. West Ireland is considered a particularly superstitious region of the country, where she activity is high. Fairy lore became especially important in the early 1900s during the Celtic revival, when their mythology became representative of Irish traditions being celebrated and reclaimed out of political necessity. William Butler Yeats was said to speak with she in his sleep, and Samuel Beckett, though known for being pragmatic, claimed he communed with a fairy in the front square of Trinity College. Douglas Hyde, the first president of Ireland, saw a strange horse run around a seven-acre field and change into a woman. England had many of the same influences in fairy culture. Early Norse mythology mirrored their own conceptions of malevolent dwarves, or duergar, while the Peeries led to more good-natured interpretations in British lore as well. Areas of Cornwall, Wales, the Isle of Man, and the Scottish Highlands all maintained rich Celtic traditions that seeped into lore around England. Scotland in particular had a rich history with Druids who also lived in underground homes topped by large artificial mounds, which were inherently tied with fairies. Sometimes referred to as little folk, fairies found a home in classic English literature, such as Geoffrey Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and later in works by William Shakespeare, like A Midsummer's Night Dream. In Demonologia, J.S. Forsyth wrote of the contemporary conception of fairies in the 1800s at the time as people of small stature, gaily dressed in habiliments of green. They took great pleasure in sensual experiences, such as eating delicious foods and making intoxicating music. Outside of magic and mischief, they could take down an enemy with their fatal elf arrows. Sometimes they would disrupt the human world by taking a human and replacing it with one of their own kind, often when they were just babies. These unlucky souls were called changelings, and they had a reputation for dying young. At the time, they blamed this fairy faded condition to explain certain mental or physical diseases or disabilities. There were also a wide range of fairies and their mystic counterparts by this point, including pixies, pygmies, sylphs, air spirits, salamanders, fire spirits, gnomes, goblins, earth spirits, undines, water spirits. These elemental spirits were thought to be everywhere, but their bodies were invisible. At the time, fairies were an accepted part of Christian mythology as well. Some believed fairies were the spirits of those who could not be placed in either heaven or hell, or that the souls of unbaptized children became fairies. 
One Protestant minister even theorized that, like Christ, fairies had the ability to become invisible, as Jesus had during the Ascension and Transfiguration. By the mid-1800s, belief in fairies was so common in England, it was not just superstition for rural communities or mystics. The lore was also accepted by artists, writers, scientists, historians, and theologians. The nation's obsession with the little folk hit a critical mass in the 1790s with their portrayals in romantic art, featuring in fairy poetry by Coleridge, Keats, and Percy Shelley. At the time, there was a nostalgia building for the innocence and wildness of nature, including pastoral fae folklore, as the country was industrializing at a rapid rate. To this end, some even believed that the fairies were leaving England because of rapid urbanization, which was bad for the little folks' physical and mental wellness. Within the next few decades, fairies would become even more popular in the Victorian imagination and investigative spirit. Using new science, technology, and concepts from the Enlightenment, investigators attempted to prove or disprove the existence of fairies. They would study physical phenomena, like elf shots and fairy bolts, which were later analyzed to be prehistoric flint shards and arrow tips, as well as fairy rings, thought to be created by the footsteps of fairies and later found to be caused by a fungus. They studied prehistoric monuments, like the standing stones at Rollwright and Stonehenge, for clues of fairies or elves. Some creatively tried to use Darwin's theory of natural selection to prove that fairies were biological creatures that evolved on a separate branch than humans, imaginatively putting them along the same genealogical line as butterflies. There is even an enameled glass vase reportedly made by fairies sitting in the Victoria and Albert Museum, built in 1852 and named for the queen who defined the era. Many fae investigators would join the Folklore Society, which was led by the prolific anthropological folklorist Edwin Sidney Hartland. Surprisingly, and yet unsurprisingly, there was a political motive to promote England's fairies. They had to compete with the popular fairy tales coming out of France and Germany at the time, including the much-admired Research of the Brothers Grimm. Perhaps it is not well known that the Brothers Grimm did, in fact, turn the quest to categorize fairies and other legendary characters into a science by bringing linguistic analysis, categorization, and systematization into their investigation. And because of the vastness of the British Empire, legends of fairies from indigenous peoples as far away as Australia and New Zealand eventually entered lore in the UK. For example, the Maori people had legends of the Patupare, who lived deep in the wilderness so as to avoid the sun, living in houses made of rolling mists. Some have also argued that legends of Maori fairies became colonized somewhere along the way, because the way these creatures look, with fair skin, reddish hair, and no tattoos, seemed rather close to a British imperialist. With fairies all over the world, we've barely scratched the surface of their history. So if there's any fae mythology you want to see next, leave it in the comments.